Is everybody ready? Yes, sir. Yes, right, sir. So yes, sir. Okay, so everybody can see the slides. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Roger that. All right, so we're going to be looking at Objective 3 Alpha, identify basic facts and principles, capabilities, limitations of satellite transmit and receive systems. With that in mind, I'm going to just read the FSC application as an RF transmission specialist or systems technicians you need a basic knowledge of transmit and receive systems to adequately maintain satellite based equipment now with that I'm going to just let you know ahead of time it is basically a radio SATCOM puts their own little words to it radio puts the special words or whatever you want to call it both of them think they're special so it just depends on what you're looking at as far as the manufacturer and again hey, the we are special in SATCOM Mr. I, Mayor I know but hey it's the same <laughs> thing <laughs> the difference is you're transmitting and receiving at the same time as opposed to you know radio which is half duplex or simplex unless you're dealing with a repeater all right so now we're going to be looking at the overview for basic radio picture fundamental radio parameters radio performance assessment and ciliary functions so this is giving you an idea of what you went over on the NSM lab we look at how many possible inputs to the nodal satellite multiplexer you got six CDI six T1E1s you got 12 NRZ which is where everybody was putting the uh, HST 3000 into and you have two hissies or high-speed serial interface so as you can see here we have a blank basic radio picture and I looked at the chat and apparently you guys do have this particular uh, handout if not I would suggest that you go find one or make one so when we take a look at the basic radio picture there's something that comes along with what we do an ob objective of it is transmit baseband to the distant end so what is baseband well baseband is nothing more than the multiplexer output here and how's it going to get to the distant end well we have modulation up conversion and amplification those are the three steps it takes the first one we have a modulator so we're going to take that baseband and convert it to what we call an intermediate frequency now if you hadn't noticed we have three different types of IF you have an intermediate frequency you have an injection frequency which is what the oscillators do and the last one which I like to call uh, the bad so I like to call the good bad and the ugly so the bad one is called image frequencies now that one is a receive type of function it's kinda like uh, if you got two FM stations at the same time trying to override each other that's what it's gonna sound like when you finally get it demodulated don't have to worry about it here because we're up converting here pretty soon so the first one we're modulating it anywhere between 70 to uh, 700 megahertz our next step is up converting it from that IF to RF so we're going to be doing the operating frequency so IF here's where that injection frequency comes from from the local oscillator and brings it up to the RF level our next one is a high powered amp and what we're going to do with that particular frequency is we're going to give it that extra boost to get it to the distant end hence the objective of the transmit when we take a look at the receive path the whole object of this one is to recover the baseband so transmits transmitting it to the distant end or transmitting baseband to the distant end the idea behind receive is to recover it so it does it in three different steps you got RF signal recovery down conversion and demodulation so let's take a look at these the first one is the LNA you're gonna see that in the Tisser 
C's and D's. The LNA is particular is let me see if I can try this again. The LNA is using its amplification techniques in order to recover the particular RF that it needs. It's going to eliminate the noise and it's going to amplify it. So the whole idea behind the LNA boosts the signal up because it's going to be extremely weak from the distant end, normally in the microvolts in some case. We look at the D, 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 let's try that one more time. We're going to look at the down converter. It's going to take that RF that we just amplified and bring it down to the IF. Now, how does it do it? Well, here comes the injection frequency again. It's going to bring it in there, mix it up, and get to the IF for us. We get to the D modulator, and it's going to take that IF and convert it into baseband, which is a usable signal for the multiplexer to use. We also have something called an AGC. AGC is always um, an receive technique being used to use that RF that's incoming and give a constant output to it. And the way the scenario for AGC is for a variant RF input, you're going to get a constant output. So what is a variant input? Well, if you set your dish up, you know, down the hallway, <laughs> that's a pretty strong signal. So my audio should sound the same if I'm, you know, 8 to 10 miles out, and it's a very weak signal. So AGC is that factor in keeping your output constant. Now your output will be the baseband. So when you draw the basic radio picture out, you can see that we have the multiplexer going into the modulator. Modulator is going to modulate it into an IF. Your IF is going to turn to RF in your up converter. And then your HPA is going to amplify it and send it out the antenna. That is to transmit the baseband to the distant end. The next scenario is when we do the receive. The receive comes into the antenna, into the LNA, low noise amplifier. It's going to amplify it, go to the down converter, convert the RF to IF. Then we're going to get into the demodulator. We're going to take that IF and convert it into baseband. And then out to our demultiplexer portion of the multiplexer. And that's how the basic radio picture works. When we look at the concepts a little bit deeper, we're looking at the modulator of converter HPA on the transmit side. You'll notice that we have this little wavy signal that's connected to the up converter as well as a down converter that is your oscillators and where it's going to take that signal and either bring it to the RF level or it's going to bring it down to the IF level depending on which uh, technique that you're using either transmit or receive. This is breaking it out for you a little bit easier to show you the objectives in both transmit and receive. We have also something called a branch assembly. And this branch assembly has an isolator, a duplexer, a filter, and a circulator that goes out the antenna. And then when it comes back in the antenna for the receive section, it comes down through the filter and then to the LNA. So all of these are considered passive devices. They're not active. What does it mean between active and passive? there's no power applied to them. It's just RF going through it. So let's look at what the branch assembly does for us. And as you can read, you can see that it directs microwave energy to and from the antenna waveguide. Then it suppresses unwanted harmonics and external noise. And of course, aids in receiver selectivity as well as permitting monitoring of the output power. So let's take a look at each one of them. The first one up is an isolator. This one 
wherever that arrow is going to the whole idea behind it is to keep the signals from mixing with each other you don't want to have RF coming back through that uh, arrow but you want your RF to go out the arrow the idea behind it is so you can prevent damage from the equipment because if you let's just give you a scenario of transmit if you're transmitting a signal going out that isolator last thing you want is your VSWR which is waveforms coming back down the line getting back into sensitive uh, transmit gear so that's the whole idea behind uh, the isolator it also provides impedance matching and when it says transitioning between different mediums, they're talking between the coax to the waveguide. Next one up is the directional coupler. Now, with directional couplers, the idea here is the transmit power is going out. I need to have an idea how much transmit power is going out to my antenna. If I didn't, then I would have to hook up a through-line watt meter for that, and where it is on the tissue, I don't think you can do it. But with a directional coupler, you're able to take a sample of that and run it back down into, I think, the baseband to give us an idea of what's actually happening. Because the last thing you want is for the power to exceed its capabilities or not exceed it at all and you're going okay I have no idea what's going on there is a monitor point by the way on your front panel for that on the baseband next up is a filter the whole idea behind this particular filter is we are going to uh, only pass what frequency I need it to go out and block all the other undesirable frequencies and hopefully eliminate some of the noise being generated by internal components of the uh, radio as well as external so when you are transmitting back in there is something called white noise which is basically a noise floor and it's like and very irritating at times so the idea is to eliminate that with the filter we have something called circulators now the circulator can and this is one of the craziest things if you look this up on Google you will find that you have diplexers and duplexers the duplexers are basically a three-way and it knows and I don't know how they're able to figure this out it knows which way the RF needs to go and it's a passive device so you can look it up on uh, Google Type in duplexers and it'll show you one. Go into images and you should be able to see one. It is two, it's actually three wires connected at one point, but there's some, I think it's a combination of inductors and capacitors in how it's able to decide what is RF that needs to go out the antenna and what RF needs to come in and it channels it in its correct designation points. Diplexers, on the other hand, are a different story, and we'll get into that later. So we have the something called Rego. RSL, AGC, gain, and output. Each one of them, they're taking the first letters of it and applying it as Rego. So RSL, that's receive signal level. That's the amount that you're getting from the receive part on your tisser you're going to receive it it's going to give you a indication of whether or not that is a strong signal or a weak signal it's going to develop it to where it resembles something in the AGC as a voltage and when it gets throughout the rest of the radio it's going to either make sure that you increase its gain to bring the signal up or it's going to decrease it depending on that RSL. The whole idea behind AGC is to make sure that your output is constant. Again, that little saying of for a variant RF input will give you a constant output. Now I'm going to give you a little scenario that we use in uh, 
air traffic control. If you've got a plane that's 200 miles out and you didn't have ADC, that signal is probably going to be very weak. So you're going to have to take your volume control and crank it all the way up. As the plane gets closer, you're going to have to decrease the gain of that volume in order to you know, not blow your ears out as, you get, as that plane gets closer. So the whole idea behind AGC is using that RF to vary the gain so you don't have to. And it goes the same way that if you're in a car and you're listening to your radio, the closer you get to your radio station, are you going to vary the audio? Probably not, because there's a inherent AGC section in your car radio. And as you get further away from it, it should still say the same, regardless of that output. So that's what AGC does for us. Now, when we look at RSL and AGC and voltage, they are directly proportional. So as you see RSL, and I'm going to look at this first box, if it's in the increase, your AGC voltage is going to represent that received signal level. It's also going to increase. But it's different when you get the gain because it wants to decrease it so therefore your output is going to stay the same. When you look at the other box, your RSL that went down, your AGC voltage is going to go down, therefore your gain is going to have to come up. So it's a weak signal, you got to bring it up. For a strong signal, you got to bring that gain down. Whole idea behind it? Keep your output constant. So when you take a look at the, you know, both of them, you got RSL and AGC are directly proportional because they represent each other. Well, AGC represents RSL. But when you look at RSL and gain, they're inversely. And that has everything to do with that signal coming in. Whole idea behind it again is that last sentence always remains constant. Because if you're having to adjust your output to a multiplexer, that's going to get old real quick. Next up, we have fundamental radio parameters. We have frequency accuracy and stability, bandwidth, frequency response, selectivity, gain, and sensitivity. So the first one up, we have frequency accuracy and stability. This is all about that oscillator and the quality of it. A good oscillator, you're going to have very good accuracy and stability. If you have a bad oscillator, you're going to have crappy uh, accuracy. Now, your stability depends on that phase lock loop and how well it's able to correct itself. I've seen old radios where the phase lock loop just could not compensate and we had to replace the whole thing. I've seen some phase lock loop that the oscillator so freaked out it still was able to uh, assist with the accuracy. Again, it's all about the oscillator when we look at frequency, accuracy, and stability. Bandwidth. That is the difference between the upper and lower frequencies of radio. Now, when you look at bandwidth, you can designate it several different ways. If you were to look at single sideband, the bandwidth is different, isn't it? You know, if your upper sideband should be about 2.7 kHz in difference from where the uh, frequency selectivity is. In other words, if I had 10 megahertz, my bandwidth should be 10 point uh, zero zero three to 10 point zero zero. Wait a minute, the first one is three zeros in a three, which is 300, and the next one should be two zeros in a three, which is a 3K. That's at 2.7. But if you're talking about the frequency range of a radio, for example, our Tisser does 14.4 to 15.25 gigahertz, you can claim that as bandwidth. We have frequency response, the range of which an audio device or system will produce or reproduce the signal within a certain tolerance. 
if you were to purchase a stereo and this is kind of hard for you to believe but if most of your manuals that come with that stereo system will tell you what the frequency response is plus or minus like 0.01 percent is pretty good same with radios it does the same thing you know what is our frequency response when we get uh, an audio signal in or an encrypted signal in it should give us something in our uh, capabilities and limitations as well as a table we have something called selectivity this is the ability to process desired frequencies and reject undesired now with selectivity it comes with two parts too you have one that's called pre-selection the other one's called overall selectivity it happens in the receive part so it's kind of crazy when you start getting into some of these C's and D's, but you can identify where pre-selection happens on the tisser and where overall selectivity happens. So pre-selection, just like the name, we're going to get rid of most of the frequencies, and by the time it gets to where that last uh, filter is, that's where your overall selectivity has, is and can weed out all the undesirables. Next up, we have gain. In other words, if I am, if I've got a stereo system and a really nice song comes on and I want to blast it, I'm going to vary the gain on my audio and I'm going to crank that bad boy up the MTLs come up and tell you to turn it down, right? <laughs> <laughs> I had to add a little humor in there, but the whole idea is gain. That's a simple one, but when you also can apply it to antennas, the more directional an antenna is, the more gain it's going to have. Is it going to amplify the signal? No, it's going to receive that signal better. So there are various different uh, scenarios with game, but in this particular one, we're looking at how well we can amplify it in our system. Sensitivity, how, how well the radio is able to distinguish between that intelligence on the carrier versus the noise. Now, if I'm not mistaken, in your PRIC 113, you guys should have a pretty good idea about doing what's called a signal plus noise and noise ratio. That's what the sensitivity is all about. So what is a signal plus noise and noise ratio? Well, the idea is I'm going to take a level where my intelligence and noise are together, figure out what that level is, and then when I eliminate the signal, the intelligence, then I'm going to see a drop. And I think the standard for most radios is approximately 10 dB or more. That has a criteria for most of our radios as far as sensitivity is concerned. Because if I don't have a 10 dB difference between my intelligence and a noise, then I'm going to have problems trying to decipher what that individual is telling me or if I'm going through encryption I'm gonna have a problem with trying to decipher what that signal is. Systems approach. With this one it's normally end-to-end -end tests that analyze the entire network identify problems prior to system failure. Uh, what we're gonna be looking at is looking at your front panel to figure out what's right and what's wrong at that point you can figure out well is it my system or is it downrange's system so when we look at a systems re approach we may have to troubleshoot someone else's pieces of equipment so just because we have a piece of equipment and we're able to determine that ours work you may have to tell that customer hey we got a problem on your end and sometimes we have to be very tactful about that too. Next up, we're going to be looking at performance measures. We have quality, reliability, and speed. So what is quality? 
Well, how closely the output resembles the input. So if you got a radio station, they're probably putting on a really high quality MP3 to send out over the airways, and when you receive it, it should resemble most of that MP3 that they that you just received. Now, back in our days, we had albums. You could actually hear the crackling of the album. Well, I was pretty good if that's what happened, you know, there at the studio. So that's good quality. Reliability. How often that system is available. We look at percentages. If my percentages is I'm 99.9% .9 of the time available and up and running, that's a good reliability. If you're only up half of the time, 50%, that's not a very good reliability. Speed. How fast the system processes data. And of course, when you guys are in, uh, what is it? Boingo that you guys got. Uh, yeah, sometimes sir, that <laughs> sometimes the system doesn't process data fast enough because you got everybody on there. The other part of that story is how quickly a radio can establish calm. In other words, how quickly can you set up that mass, put your in or yeah, put the antenna on it and fire up your radio? How quickly can you get that done? The quicker, the better. That's the speed. Next up, we have something called auxiliary functions. All this applies to the tisser that we have been uh, going over. We look at switching, auxiliary channel, performance monitors, and fault indicators. Switching. This is when that, uh, when you have your equipment up, how quickly that you can substitute it with another piece of equipment. What is really nice is if you've got like two or three multiplexers side by side and if one goes down it's automatically going to switch over to the other. Oh wow, goes back to the reliability doesn't it? We look at auxiliary channel. This one is about not having to uh, add to the mission bit stream. Now what does that mean by mission bit stream? Well that's your traffic, that's the multiplexer traffic. The idea here is, and this is on the tisser, we're going to have our own separate channel to do all of our troubleshooting and it doesn't add to or take away from the baseband signal that's going in there. That's what makes this thing so nice. We have performance not monitors. We have things like the baseband and the RF module or assembly. I call them module assemblies. They're, just, they're interchangeable in my world. Uh, when we look at performance monitors, we have a whole bunch of lights. We actually have a uh, gauge to look at whether or not we're uh, receiving at a prescribed level. Uh, we have voltages to take a look at. All that from that meter or gauge. Uh, you've got lights. If the light is extinguished and you're operate, that's a good thing. If the light is on, i.e. summary alarm, then you got problems, which relates back down to fault indicators. Uh, there's a thing on there where you might have a visual or audible alarm. The audible alarm could be that squeal that's coming out of your headset. That's probably telling you that you didn't push the headset connector in all the way. That's a hint, by the way. It's going to help you with troubleshooting because that's the last thing you want to do. So when you get these visual indicators, which I just mentioned about the summary alarm being on or off. Uh, that would be a good indicator if it's on that I got problems and I need to start troubleshooting. So we've looked at the basic radio picture, the fundamental radio parameters, radio performance assessment, and ancillary functions. Any questions out there? Are you guys awake? Uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay.
Okay. What are some of the line replaceable units in this? Oh, so the LRUs. Yes, well, you have five in the baseband, and you have three in the RF assembly. Those are LRUs. I don't know exactly their names, but one of them, I think, in the RF assembly is the microwave. Uh, help me out there, Sergeant Young. You probably have access to it real quick. But you should oh, be yes, able to pull, sir, it. pull it up. Yeah. You should be able to look this up in your tech order and it's it'll tell you that you have three on the RF assembly and five on the baseband assembly. That's line replaceable units. In other words, if you detect a problem in the baseband unit and you think it's the power supply or the breaker in there, you should be able to unscrew the front panel, pull out the separate card, and it's a remove and replace. That right, just like, the R, uh, just like the RT1319, correct? Yes, exactly. Mr. Mayor, will Sir. a lot of the equipment we have when we're operational, will they all ha also have trouble diagnosing, or sorry, the trouble analysis diagrams inside their TOs? Uh, you will have some that do and some that you won't be able to touch. Uh, for example, the Harris radios that are getting ready to come online, the uh, PRC-160s, they're under warranty. So the only thing you can troubleshoot is, is it the radio or is it my antenna gear? So once you find out it's a radio, you're going to ship it back to them. There are other pieces of equipment, and I know that in the air traffic control world, they've got a Jerk 171 and a 211. Most of those, you have to troubleshoot them down to the component level. There are a few, though, that you have to do a remove the card and replace the card. I think the power amp and the oscillator are the two that... Uh, are what we call line replaceable units, which is remove and replace. The rest of it, you have to troubleshoot. Yes, sir. So it just depends on what the equipment is out in the field. I've had some where you just use the computer and it tells you what the problem is, correct it on the computer, and you're done. Sounds pretty efficient, sir. Yeah, it is. But, you know, again... You're going to see in different places, you're going to have old equipment, and then you're going to have brand new equipment. So you got to be prepared for both. Do they also have um, full units that you can swap out? Because it's not exactly um, convenient to have to ship back a radio and then have all that downtime. Right. I think in the... I think Sergeant Young could probably answer this, but I'm going to just tell you what I've experienced. I've had some where we have extra radios sitting back at the shop that we find out, okay, it is the radio. We'll bring an extra one with us when we go out to wherever we need to be. We'll remove and replace the radio and just send it back. Uh, the turnaround time is pretty quick on those. So, I mean, we're talking two weeks max if you're overseas. But, again, it depends on your supply system and how well they respond. Can you uh, assist there, Sergeant Young? So, what was that? I apologize. I was looking something up. Could you repeat the question, please? Uh, a lot of the equipment that we have might be under warranty. So, do we have lots of extra uh, equipment that we can use to quickly replace so by and large, it, it just depends on what kind of system that you're working on. So whenever I worked at Langley, I was uh, assigned to a, a unit where we operated and maintained a fixed SACOM terminal. And that was completely and totally almost LRUs when you're talking about our actual communications equipment. Now, when it came to the antenna, you had those other components that the supply folks were in charge of keeping on hand, and they also had all those extra cards. And when I say cards, when he, when Mr. Mayor was telling me about the LRUs, they're literally like, they look like little sheets, like little sheet cards. They're probably about, I don't know, four inches thick, and as tall as those baseband and RF assemblies are that you've seen, and then you will unscrew them, 
or loosen them from the rack that they're mounted on. Sorry about that. Get that window closed. Please don't interrupt me. So you just unscrew them from the rack, or the assembly itself, and just pull them out. Like, you disconnect all the cabling and all the connections from the back. You pull that card out, and then slot in a brand new one, and hook it right up, and just configure all of your settings, and fire it up. And it should work exactly the same as the last one did before it stopped working, because obviously that's the only reason that you would need to really do a removal and replacement. Now, when it comes to specific radios, let's say... Like the, the radio that you're going to be using in your next block, like the uh, PRC-117 Golf. If that radio were to break itself somehow and was beyond the scope of repair as far as like basic troubleshooting steps, turning it off, turning it back on, having those built-in tests ran, and having it correct itself somehow, you would send that radio back to the manufacturer. Because we're not allowed to, in today's Air Force, by and large, Unless you work at a specific unit that still cannibalizes stuff, which I haven't heard of in a long time, um, by and large, you will be just be expected to take that particular model, fill out a return form, and send it back to the manufacturer. And then the manufacturer, because we have a contract with them, would be expected to fill out a requisitions form via your supply, and then supply would get that radio that needed to get replaced ordered via Harris for this for this example. And then they would send a brand new replacement out to your unit so that you could have that backup still available to you. Does that answer your question? Yes, sir, it does. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions before we go to the next uh, objective? No, uh, sir. Uh, uh, is uh, on the auxiliary uh, functions is performance monitors and fault indicators. That sounds like the same thing to me. But, um... So, the performance monitors are the actual functions of the equipment or components inside your system whose job it is to produce some type of fault indication. The, uh, so your performance... Go ahead, sir. The meter does a dual function. It tells you what's happening, and also it can alarm you as to what it's doing that is correct, and it can also tell you what it's doing is incorrect. You know, for example, your first thing you're going to look at is voltages. If you just happen to see that one voltage was non-existent, now you got to troubleshoot. Well, that's an indicator as well as an assessment. So it's a dual purpose there. Hopefully I answered your question. So. Yes, sir. Understood. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Anybody else? <laughs> All right. So let me get out of this and uh, bring up the next one there, Sergeant Young. Can you search? Yeah. So. Standing by. Three Bravo, correct? Yes, yes, sir, that's it. Thank you, sir, for the review. You're welcome. It's up, ready to go, sir. Copy that. All right, in Three Bravo, we will be identifying the basic facts about principles, capabilities, and limitations of modems. The FSC application for this unit. As an RF transmission systems technician, communications across a network will require knowledge of, any, of many devices, such as modems. For our overview, we will be covering general modem principles, different types of modulation, forward error correction, interleaving. We will address a couple of the traditional modems and the IP-based modems. To start us off, we will talk about general modem principles, and the purpose of the modem is to modulate an analog carrier to encode digital input data. And conversely, on the receive side, it will demodulate the incoming carrier to decode the transmitted information. Our baud rate, or also known as symbol rate, 
is considered to be the speed or bandwidth per second. So you know where we talk about bandwidth previously, we discussed it being the data rate of your system or range of frequencies, your baud or symbol rate is identified as how quickly can that system produce that bandwidth. Does that make sense? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Oh, okay, cool. Because it'll refer to the it'll refer to your speed as baud rate or symbol rate, sometimes bouncing between one or the other or both. So just make sure that you'll keep that in mind. Anytime you see baud or symbol rate, it's talking about the speed of the bandwidth that is provided. And this is also determined by the type of modulation technique used, and we talk about the symbol rate of each type of modulation later on in the next slide. And getting right into types of modulation, modulating an analog carrier signal has three basic components, frequency, amplitude, and phase. In frequency shift keying, you're going to modulate only the frequency of the analog carrier. This is done by alternating in frequency as the digital input data varies between logic ones and zeros. This particular type of modulation uses one bit per symbol. So that's in the previous slide, or the, pre the two slides ago when it said, it's determined, the baud rate or the symbol rate is determined by the type of modulation technique being used. There's that symbol rate for FSK. It is one bit per symbol. And I'm down at amplitude shift keying now, sir. So in amplitude shift keying, we will modulate only the amplitude of the analog carrier. We do this by alternating an amplitude as the digital signal varies between logic ones and zeros. So it's the same thing as a frequency shift keying, except for now we're talking about modulating the amplitude instead of frequency. This, this type of modulation also has one bit per symbol. In phase shift keying, we're going to modulate the phase of the analog carrier. There's a couple different types of modulation techniques in phase shift keying that we're going to discuss. You have binary phase shift keying and quadrature phase shift In binary phase shift keying, you will alternate in phase only if the logic state changes. So in a zero degree phase shift, it is as you would think things should occur, where a logic one is followed by a logic one. Logic zero is followed by a logic zero, but if you were to take that phase and shift it 180 degrees, it would then be the inverse. So there would be a negative representation. So you have your logic one followed by logic zero and vice versa. This type of modulation also uses one bit per symbol. In our quadrature phase shift keying type of modulation, this one uses two bits per symbol. So we're getting a little faster now, right? The first three that we discussed, frequency shift keying, amplitude shift keying, and binary phase shift keying would all use only one bit per symbol. This one has two and it is a precursor to the more efficient technique called QAM, which is quadrature amplitude modulation. This one surpasses them all in providing three bits per symbol up to 10 that some systems can facilitate today. Does anybody have any questions about the different types of modulation? Okay, forward error correction. Your distant modem is going to be responsible for performing error forward error correction. So you need to look at this as, I've sent this information to my distant end and it is out of my hands now. If anything needs to be corrected, it's on them. So your distant end modem is going to perform forward error correction. It does this by using multiple copies of the same transmitted message to correct for data errors. Now, when it says it's expensive, it means that it's expensive in that the equipment used to perform forward error correction costs a lot. Costs a lot. 
the method in and of itself isn't as expensive as the equipment, which is associated with a lot of these things. When we talk about audio repeaters later, those are expensive too, and it's because the equipment used to facilitate the actual performance is expensive. So how does forward air correction happen, Sergeant Young? Oh, glad you asked. <laughs> forward air correction uses forward air correction rates in that the first digit, so when you're looking at this, these forward air correction rates, you have one half, three quarters, two thirds, five, six, seven eighths. It's not so much a fraction as it is the number that's to the left of the forward slash represents how many bits of data will be received before that six. So, so for instance, that five over six. The first five bits of information will, be, will contain all of the data that is being transmitted and received. And then that sixth bit is used for any kind of correction that the system needs to perform due to like server or signal degradation, path loss, what have you. And it's going to continue to receive that original transmitted message and compare all copies together to construct the original message to use so that it's intelligent. The overall system baud rate, or your symbol rate, is impacted by a few things. So this, so here we're talking about when it says overall system baud. What did I say that baud or symbol rate represents? It is one bandwidth per second, correct, sir? Speed. Speed, yeah. Speed. How fast is it? So we already have the bandwidth. How fast can we get the bandwidth to occur? How many bits per symbol? So it's how fast it is. And there's a few things that impact that. They are your data rate, your modulation type. When it says modulation type bits per symbol, we discuss how many bits per symbol each type of modulation is capable of facilitating. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, so that's a fact. So that's a factor. And then you have your forward error correction rate. And that's how many bits will be transmitted of the data that you are receiving before we have to start making corrections. So it's all about how quickly can we get done what we need to get done, and then that determines our overall system body. In interleaving... Interleaving is one form of forward error correction, and this is done by mixing the data using time division to correct for errors or recover lost bits. So whereas before, you were losing a whole block, in interleaving, you only use a bit from the block that's lost rather than the whole thing. So it's just a more efficient version of forward error correction. Do you have anything that you'd like to highlight about interleaving, Mr. Mayor? Negative. Copy. Okay. And for our traditional modem types, we have our telephone modem, which is used by our plain old telephone system. I haven't seen one of these since... I haven't seen a POTS phone since, I think, 2013. And they're... They're getting, they're starting to get phased out. I don't know. I think there might be some of them still in use, but by and large, we usually use voice over IP phones right now, or VoIP phones, and that just plugs straight in from your LAN connection coming out of your wall into a port in the back of your phone, and then that internet connection is bridged through your phone to your computer when you're talking about the setups that we have, like at Squawks. It's been a long time since I've seen a POTS phone, but they use the 56K dial-up modems. I don't know if anybody in here is old enough to remember dial-up or uh, the AOL sounds that it would make whenever you were trying to connect to the internet. Yes, sir, the horrible yeah, sound that it makes. It, it, makes me, it makes me cringe just thinking about it. I can hear it, and it's like fingernails on a chalkboard. But it was the worst because anytime anybody ever got on the phone while you were on the internet, especially if you were trying to, like, you know, download some music or, like, download a movie or something like that, 
somebody would pick up the phone to call someone, it would just chop your connection out entirely and so that they could make the phone call. But since then, we've kind of evolved, and one of the new types of modems that we use are the satellite modems, and those are used for communications outside of deployed location, for tactical and strategic situations through, situations through satellite. So this facilitates transmission of data, information, voice, whatever it is that you're trying to send to your distant end, what we just classify as intelligence, by use of satellites. So that might be something that you might be able to hit on with one of your blockade instructors. Say, hey, sir, how would we interface one of these Kirkland 17 golfs with a satellite mode? And then next we have our fiber optic modems. These are capable of extremely high data rates. Shocker. Most everybody in here knows about fiber optic and what all that entails, I feel like, at this point in their career, if not in their lives. And is not susceptible to RF or electromagnetic interference. Why would fiber optic be immune to RF or electromagnetic interference? Because it's light. Wait, light doesn't have anything to do with RF or EMI? Light is not affected by EMI. <laughs> Thank you. That was a trick question. Yes, good job. Good job, go. Yeah, so light can't be affected by RF or EMI. It's light. It doesn't have anything to do with RF. So then you have your five stages of your fiber optic modem, which I highly encourage you to go over because this is one of those things that you kind of just have to repeat. I don't really have a ha-ha funny for this one. So you have your stage one, which is your modulator. Stage two is your transmitter. Stage three is your receiver. Stage four is your filter. And then lastly, in stage five, you have your demodulator. And that has to go through all of those stages in order through a fiber optic modem in order you, for you to make a successful transmission. So in your IP-based modems, your IP modems access the internet a little bit differently than traditional modems. So when we were talking about your traditional modems, that's where you had your 56K or your SATCOM modem. And with those, you have to request access and be provided authorization to be able to get on the internet and use it or send a message, what have you, like an email, phone call, whatever. So that's that was the process of actually dialing up. That's where that cringy screeching sound from your AOL instant messenger or your AOL dial-up connection came from. So that was you accessing the ISP server and then that had to go ping to their server. They had to authorize your access and make sure that you were approved and then they would send back the authorization saying, okay, cool. You're allowed to be on the internet. We're going to go ahead and let you on. But with an IP-based modem, IP is always on. So uh, IP modems are used today. Have you ever had a problem getting on the internet whenever you need to when you are at home and you're using your own modem or your router? Nope. Uh, I mean, unless you had some kind of, you know, network outage type thing. It's always available, right? So anytime you want to pop on, you could have disconnected from your Wi-Fi, gone and taken a trip for a week, came back, popped right back on your Wi-Fi, and it's ready there, boom, right? So that's what it means. By IP is an always-on modem versus dial-up where you have to request and be provided authorization to get access. In your iDirect modems, you have four different bands that is capable of operating in. Those are C, X, K, U, and K, A. Now, I kind of have a funny thing to help remember this by. It's a little cringy, and my students have told me that that's why it's so easy to remember is because the cringe factor is on 100. So, iDirect modems operate in CX KUKA bands. Yeah, it's pretty gross, right? <laughs> that's disgusting. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, then that's exactly what, that's what they all say. But then, you know what? They come to me later on, they're like, Hey, sir, you know what? That actually made it really easy. That, that was great. So I appreciate that. But yeah, it's um, CX KUKA, CX KUKA bands. So you've got optimization for your TCP over IP protocol and traffic over your satellite. The throughput of these iDirect modems is a 4.2 megabit uplink with multiple users on a single channel. But if you have a single user on a single channel, your downlink is then increased to 18 meg. So... Fewer users on just one channel, you get faster speed. Makes sense, right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. 
Now, Mr. Mayor, I've actually not figured out why this blurb is included on this slide, and I've gone and looked through it a couple of times. What is the purpose of identifying the limitation on a single user for iDirect? Do you know? I would actually have to go into the software portion. Right. I, I don't know. Because I've never actually interfaced with that iDirect software before, so when I read that, I was like, oh, I'm not really too keen on what that is. <laughs> I've looked at the book, and when they brought this up, I couldn't find it in the book. Uh, I wasn't the one that put this in there. Uh, from what I understand, when they did the training, this was one of those specifics that I guess this was a uh, avenue for uh, encryption to happen on it for you know, like your your chain of command, the top end of it. You know, like if they needed to get this particular one and they need to be the sole owner of it in other words your colonel or whoever it is the general that's out there they're the ones that would have access to it at least that's what i think it is for it's kind of like okay. out of band cool. management uh I, i'm not 100 percent certain but when it says limitation to a single user, I'm thinking, okay, I, I've seen some of these uh, kernels and general setups where they, when they pick up that phone, they have a direct link to whatever it is that they need on the distant end. Kind of like the, uh, was it chief, uh, the, the commissioner in Batman being able to pick up the Bat phone and, and talk directly to Batman. So that's basically what it amounts to. And it's all encrypted. If I ever see it, I'll make sure to refer to it as the bad phone. Yes, there you go. <laughs> well, it was the only analogy I could come up with. That's great. No, I love it. No, it's great. He's a, he's a bad phone. Oh, yeah. All right, cool. Does anybody have any questions about anything that was covered in 3 Bravo? No, sir. All right, moving right along to 4-Alpha. Let me know when you're good to go, Mr. Mayor. I'm good. All right, Let me just get a drink of water. Thirsty, you will like. All right. For Alpha, the objective is to identify basic facts about the principles, capabilities, and limitations of line of sight radio systems. Right now, I have so just to off. be clear, the TISR is a line of sight radio. So if you can't see each other or you put some kind of obstruction in between them, you won't be able to talk. And we'll talk about that, which is one of the limitations. And one of the next slides, but just to cover the AFSC application, as an RF transmission systems technician, some missions may require you to set up and maintain line of sight communications equipment. As an overview, we will cover the line of sight principles, repeaters, and some of their limitations. Line of sight principles. Line of sight is a propagation mode that has no physical obstacles between the transmitting and receiving antennas. This is important to know because if you do have something that is in between you and your distant end, you all won't be able to talk. But there are ways to overcome that, and we can do that by applying repeaters to our network. We'll get into that here in a little bit. And our line of sight principles, our radio horizon extends 15% farther away than our optical horizon and approximately 33% more than our true horizon. This information, I think, is available in one of the packets that you should have been handed out. I usually print this out and staple it together with the C's and D's that I distribute to my classes for the TISR. Does everybody have this this uh, paper, like with this picture on it, where it says True Earth Radius? Oh, no, sir. No, sir. No, sir. Okay. All right. You should have got well, in your, uh, when you downloaded your resource systems, there should be a electronic copy of this along with the repeaters and the C's and D's that uh, cover the tisser. Yes, right. it's on there. Usually, 
That's usually the one that I hand out with uh, every class when we get to this portion. I just wish this particular one would show what's on the uh, um, the file that they have of the electronics because it shows the actual 15% and the 33%. It measures it out for you so that you can see yeah. it, right? Yeah, it's on there. Absolutely. I just wish it was on the slide. Understood. No, yes, sir, I agree. So with our line of sight parameters, or line of sight principles, excuse me, our line of sight typically... Any line of sight will typically operate on the following parameters. Your range will operate between 20 to 50 miles, your frequency between 3 to 50 gig, and your power from 1 to 5, or 1 to 5 watts, excuse me. And a practical application for our line of sight radio would be to replace cable, like any kind of cable connection, and that could be because of, like it says, terrain and distance. So if you've got these huge Rocky Mountains and you're like, man, that's a little bit too rugged for the lines that we're trying to run for a point-to-point -point connection, we're just going to go ahead and go around it. And then you could set up a series of repeaters so that you can extend your line of sight signal from where you are around like a, like a mountain or a hill or just a tree line, whatever the case is, or put, in, put a repeater on a tower that's high enough for you to be able to increase the look angle of your antenna and bounce that signal and have it repeated to wherever it is that it needs to go. On the, on the mountain that NORAD is in, there's actually a bunch of radio antennas up there. Nice. Yeah, that's, I mean, that might be a part of their repeater system that they have up there just so that communications never have to go down and you can talk to whoever you need to. That's awesome. I didn't know that. So the repeaters are considered basic transmitters and receivers. They must be able to perform two of the following functions. Frequency translation, which translates your receive signal to a new output frequency, and amplification. So say that your, so when we're talking about radio line of sight principles, and you have a radio that can, just for the sake of the argument, can only transmit 35 miles, but you need it to go 50 and it's a line of sight radio. You have to set up a repeater, and then that repeater has to be able to do both of these things because if your radio can only transmit 35 miles to get to that repeater, which will probably set it in a little bit farther or a little bit closer to you than that just so it doesn't have to stretch, and you don't have too much path loss, you would then use that repeater to re-amplify, and if the distance requires it, translate whatever band you're operating in into the one that needs to be received on your disc. Does that make sense? Yes, sir. Cool. All right. Of the types of repeaters we will discuss, we have an RF repeater, an IF repeater, a bass band repeater, and lastly, the audio repeater. Now, our RF repeater is going to be the most basic layout of all of the repeaters that we'll talk about today. The RF repeater follows a basic radio design, only utilizes an LNA and an HPA. <laughs> Translates your RF and amps it. Because of this, it introduces the largest amount of distortion to your... Sorry, Young, you cut out. I apologize. I was getting a call. From a telemarketer. Can you all hear me now? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, that was extremely annoying. I don't know how many times I got to tell him to put me on that do not call list. Frustrating. All right. So, what part did I cut out in? Just throughout that whole thing, the explanation of the RF repeater? Yes, sir. Okay. Copy. So, the RF repeater is going to utilize a basic radio design and that it only uses an LNA and an HPA. So it will translate your RF and amplify it. That's all it's worried about doing. So if you see in this picture, it says you have that incoming 4400 meg. The LNA processes the 4400 meg, mixes it with the local oscillator resonance at 260 to produce the 4660 meg output, and then the HPA is just going to amp it up, send it. Pretty simple. So because of its simplicity, and the function that it performs, 
this was going to introduce the largest amount of distortion amongst all of the repeaters that we'll talk about today. Jeep and noise. Yeah, not, yeah, Jeep and noise, there you go. So in your IF repeater, this one still follows a basic radio design, but we're going to include a down converter and an up converter in this one. So it's going to amplify your RF. So we have the incoming 4400 meg, the LNA processes the 4400 meg into your down converter, where that local oscillator frequency is then, it's, it strips that local oscillator frequency from your incoming 4400 meg to produce your 70 megahertz IF output. So I don't know if y'all remember from block two, we talk about sum and difference mixers. So this is essentially what's going to happen here is that you've got a difference mixer in essence in that down converter and it's going to subtract that local oscillator frequency from your incoming 4400 meg to produce the 70 megahertz IF output. Your IF output will then be amplified by that IF amp with a 70 megahertz output and then up converted or have that sum mixed from your local oscillator in your converter to produce your 4660 megahertz output amplified with the eight by the HPA and then sent out the other end of the repeater. Because of this, and we have a little bit more filtration here and translation, there's a little bit less distortion that's produced or added to the signal than in an RF repeater. In your baseband repeater, this also follows a basic radio design. However, we have the LNA to a demodulator and then a modulator to the HPA. This demodulates the receive signal and it can, the baseband repeater can be used to drop or insert groups of modulated traffic. So if you see in the picture below, you have your transmitter sending the signal. It is going to be received by your baseband repeater and then you have that little box down there that has like a telephone, a computer, and a keyboard and it's inserting modulated traffic into that transmission without interrupting it and then having all of that repeated and sent out. Pretty easy to understand, right? Or is anybody hung up on that? Yes, sir. Cool. All right, and then your audio repeater, last but not least, utilizes a full radio design. It is the most expensive, and like I said before, it's the most expensive because of the equipment that it takes to perform the functions that an audio repeater does. So, like, the, the actual function itself isn't expensive, it's the equipment that's used to perform the function that makes the cost high. This one can also be used to drop and insert user service, just like eBay. And it has the internal MUX and DMUX? Right. That's what, I, that's what I was saying whenever it says like, it uses a full radio design. It's got everything. All right. And then and now that we've covered repeaters, let's talk about some of the limitations. I know we've kind of hit on these already, but just to cover the slide, it says the limitations of repeaters are distance, equipment capability, terrain, and your needs of the net. So your equipment capability was a lot to do with how I said if your radio can only transmit 35 miles and you need to go 50, that's a limitation of your equipment, right? And then your needs of your communication network being I need to go 50 miles, not 35, man. All right, hold on. Let's throw a repeater in there so we can get this signal extended out to where it needs to go. And then the distance and terrain, I kind of hit on when I was talking about trying to go around like a mountain or like a tree line. That's what that has to do with. So when we're talking about a noise factor, and this says frequency division multiplexing, you can go up to eight consecutively, so you can use up to... You can repeat your signal with these repeaters up to eight times using frequency division multiplexing before you start to experience noise and distortion in your signal. But in time division multiplexing, you can have 15 of these repeaters repeating your signal before that has to occur, or before that starts to occur. Rather. Does anyone have any questions on 4-alpha? No, sir. No, we're not solid, sir. Copy, copy. 
Mr. Mayor, is there anything that I covered that you would like to elaborate on or cover again? No, you did really, really well on it. Okay. Sweet. Well, if nobody has any other questions for me, and you don't need anything from either of us, you are good to go. Thanks for coming out, y'all. Thank you, sir. 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 All right, thanks, no sir. problem. Yep, y'all good night. You too, sir. You too.